What's going on? YouTube Metal Complex here, and welcome to episode 8 of the Quest for the Perfect Budget Knife. If you're new to my channel or this series, essentially what this is, is uh, it's my ideas of all of the different elements that could hypothetically make up, in my opinion, the ideal budget knife. Um, real quick, I'm going to go over the episode list so kind of everybody's on the same page. Um, there are 10 episodes in this series, and we are already down to number 8. So, if anything that I say in this episode doesn't make sense to you or you disagree with it, I would urge you to go back and actually look at these other episodes and kind of see how I came to the conclusions that I did. Um, you can see here, overall size and blade length. I actually said that there were two different ideal sizes, a large and small, to cater to different people and at the same time cater to the whole legality situation. Um, about eight and a quarter inches on the large size, seven and a quarter inches on the small size. Handle materials, I would prefer G10 with a steel liner, um, T8 pivot, T8 body screws, um, some sort of deep carry clip. Deployment, I want thumb stud um, that double as uh, external stop pins um, for reasons that I've explained in episode three. Lock type, go with a liner lock that's going to keep costs down. Ergonomics, uh, contoured scales, simple shape, forward choil, definitely to cater to the whole ergonomic thing and to couple with um, getting your whole hand around the smaller size on the blade. Again, if you disagree with me, just go watch the episode. You can leave the comments there. <laughs> that sounds really dismissive, but just for the sake of moving on. Blade shape, I'm looking for a drop point blade. Um, uh, a small uh, uh, flat maybe uh, similar to the shaman we'll talk about the shaman here the hoe gritter's got a good example I really like the um, the rat one and rat two uh, that's kind of what this series is based on blade steel kind of concluded one of three 154 cm n690 and d2 based on current trends and costs you know associated with certain steels in the in the budget knife world today we're going to be talking about x factor and aesthetics uh, customization and modularity. We're going to be talking about a lot of stuff today. This is a heavily opinionated episode. There's going to be a lot of stuff that some people disagree on. You know, aesthetics, that's subjective. Um, X factor subjective, but we're going to try and cover customization and modularity in a way that can cater to a lot of people. Um, remember that the small details and price are still um, left to go. A lot of people are like, how are you defining budget? Because that's different for every single person. For the sake of covering as many points as I possibly can in this video, budget to me is going to be anything under $100. Ah! Don't wait. Don't, don't worry. Just wait until the price episode. I know everybody gets so up in arms about that. Wait till the price episode. We'll talk about it there. Um, if you are enjoying this series, you're enjoying my channel, uh, essentially the, the reason that this is all possible, the reason I'm able to put out um, at least one uh, video a day, uh, sometimes two a day, is 100% it's due to my patrons. So if you're enjoying my content and you'd like to help support me, um, don't feel obligated to, but if you'd like to, there's a link in the description where you can go check it out and kind of see what it's all about. So, um, X Factor, what do I mean by X Factor? Everybody has their own X Factor, that in indescribable quality that a knife has that draws you to it. Sometimes it's aesthetic, sometimes it's a sound, sometimes it's a feeling, sometimes it's a combination of a bunch of different stuff. My X Factor will be different than your X Factor, or maybe it will be the same. Nobody can be wrong. You can't be wrong, I can't be wrong, so it's pointless to argue about it. Um, but what I'm looking for, I'll just tell you guys right off the bat, is a simple design and a simple aesthetic. What do I mean by a simple aesthetic? Here are three knives that I enjoy and carry on a daily basis that I would say have simple aesthetics. Um, now these are big other than the bug out, but I really, really enjoy the simple aesthetic of the bug out. Now, I mean with the upgraded scales, of course, I do not like those gravity scales. The Shaman and the, the Hoag Ritter. Um, these are three knives that I really like. I am not the type of person to go after something that's got a lot of really, really crazy lines. You know, I, I sometimes I like like the uh, texturing that's on the XM18 over there. I like that. That adds a, a certain level of flash to it, but it's also very simple, right? So that's kind of what I'm looking for here. Um, and also on top of that, the other reason I'm looking for that is because I'm trying to think from a manufacturing standpoint. I mean, I, I can hypothetically think up anything I want, like, oh, I want a titanium integral made in the United States on, with 20 CV steel. No, no, no. I want Damacor and I want uh, Timascus and I want it to cost less than $50. That's stupid. <laughs> That's not, that doesn't make any sense. We have to think, you know, what uh, about manufacturing cost? A simple design, a more simple construction, less parts, less lines, less crap to go over, it's gonna cost less. So in this situation, that actually works out really, really where, well to, to go for something that's a little bit more of a bug out simple look while still having the contouring of maybe a shaman 
And taking a look at some of these, we'll go over these quickly, some of these other budget models. By the way, each of these will have Amazon affiliate links. If I can't remember the name and you're interested in it, you can go down in the description. Um, and then if you want to buy it, you can pick it up. Stuff going on here that I find unnecessary. Um, and while it, it's cool, you know, uh, in a lot, uh, a lot of different ways, I just don't need all of this, you know. And um, I, I, one of the big factors here is... Um, customization. You know, I, that's one of the topics on uh, the, the episode today is I think it's really important, you know, if this, if this um, knife is going to cater to as many people as possible, um, maybe it's released in the standard boring colors that we always get, you know, right? The, uh, the OD green, right? The tan uh, and the black. Um, but the reason people love the Benchmade uh, Griptilian so much the Hinder XM18 and what seems to be, you know, more so, more here recently, the bug out is all the different options for customization. Now, Benchmade got smart and put the uh, Griptilian in their custom shop so people could build them right there on the website. Whether or not they're overpriced is another issue. They're obviously not having trouble selling them because people are buying them. So people like customization. Rick Hinder built his whole business model on the make it your own thing. So whether or not you mean it's it's a it's a fact that people want to have their own thing. Some people are okay; they buy it, they they take it out of the box, and they just use it the way that it is. But people like to add their own flair. If they didn't, we wouldn't have these really extravagant Instagram pages of people with their own custom stuff. Some people have built aftermarket businesses based on this idea. So I think, from a manufacturing standpoint, if I can set it up. Um, to be, uh, you know, really tempting from an aftermarket part maker to make custom scales for it, right? Even if, um, you know, my company, my hypothetical company that's making this budget knife is not reaping the benefits directly from the sales of these aftermarket parts, it might actually drive the, um, the demand for the knives that I'm selling up just because it's supported by such an amazing aftermarket, right? That might be the reason that Benchmade has not thrown the uh, bug out yet into the um, into the custom shop group. You know, we I, I don't know. Um, all I know is is I feel like it would definitely be a good idea to build the knife in a way to set the parts up in a way that would be beneficial to you know the aftermarket or custom parts. Absolutely. So this is a little bit crazy. Uh, how about the uh, is this the uh, this is the bare knuckle. I like it. It's just too many lines, you know. And again, it's not the not the materials that I want. We're looking for liner and G10 because those those are a setup. You know, that's a setup where the scales are going to be really easy to make. I mean, can you imagine here? We're not to this knife yet, but liner, simple scale on top of it, no problem for somebody making aftermarket parts, right? Um, the uh, the Yobo Tool Silverback. This is actually I a spoiler alert. I actually really like this knife. This is the the only knife from Yobo Tool that I can honestly say that I, I really like. Um, I like the simple look of this. We're getting closer here, right? Simple look. Easy to, I mean, if these were all G10 scales and you didn't have this weird steel piece back here, it would be easy um, to create some some custom parts for it. But it's a little bit, a little skinny. I kind of want, kind of want the, this width here, you know? Why? Because I want that, I've talked about it in blade shape, I want that you know, that starting stock thickness of around the ideal 135 thousandths I'm looking for. I want plenty of room to drop down to a cutting edge that gets pretty thin, but I want strength to maintain out towards the tip, and I want a knife body that sort of, um, you know, exemplifies that. The TS-49 from Tucson, one of the very best budget knives currently available out there. This thing's incredible. Titanium and carbon fiber. We're getting closer here. It's a little bit thicker on the blade that I want it, and the blade's not quite as tall as I'd want. And the handle is definitely more robust than the Silvback, maybe just in terms of thickness, but I still want it a little wider and taller, right? It's also a little bit complicated. Uh, the Gonzo FH12 is an amazingly simple design. It's an example of what we can get, you know, in the knife world right now for about 20 to 25 bucks. I mean, all steel design. Obviously, you know, I would rather, you know, instead of an all steel frame lock, I would rather this be thinner steel and some G10 uh, scales and, and have it be a, a liner lock so that I can have that uh, have the texturing or the, the contoured shape that I want without it being ultra slippery. That's another reason I want G10. Um, 
I always forget the name of this one, but I, this is a really compelling design. It's very, very simple. It doesn't have exactly the ergonomic lines that I'm looking for, but it's very, it's a good example of the aesthetic that I want and an aesthetic that could do well with all the other little things that I want. It's got the thumb studs, but I want them to be external stops, so it'd have to be moved back. I would want a forward twill, so this would have to be changed. But in terms of how they've done the scales and the look, I like this. I'd want more contouring. I'd want the whole thing to be a little slimmer. They got the, the lines correct, or, or the uh, liners correct coming out to the lip, that, the way that I would want it anyway. And by the way, you guys all know this by now, but the point of this series is, again, not to bend everybody to my way of thinking. Now, this is just how I would do it. And I kind of, I like getting people's gears going, you know, because you don't have to think exactly like me. You, you can just take my approach to this and apply it to your own tastes, your own philosophy. I mean, that's, that's really what this is. This is night philosophy, right? Coming from some guy with a camera <laughs> and the power of the internet. But yeah, this is the aesthetic more so that I'm going for. Simple yet ergonomic, you know, Contouring and chamfering can really make that work without having to add unnecessary complexity to the design, right? Uh, moving on here, the rat. I mean, here's a great example of why that's successful. The aftermarket is full of parts for this guy, right? Very simple design, functional blade shape. At a, what is it? At? It's about 125 thousandths to stock with fully uh, start with fully flat ground blade. Not really a choil up here. I wish it was. Uh, but it's not. It's in the right. It's it's in one of the steels I would prefer. Has too many parts. We've talked about you know simplifying the amount of parts using just two T8 body screws and having either um, standoffs back here or a bag spacer. But in terms of the scale, super simple, right? Nice chamfering or, or around the outside. It's not contoured, but nice chamfering. No sharp edges. Liners that come out to the outside. A little bit heavy, but that's a great example, right? Now it's a good aesthetic. But it's not perfect. This is a little bit wonky, you know. I like this aesthetic. I like the lines, you know, straight, simple. You know, I like the FH12. Just I'm just looking for a little bit more width. You know, this one has the width and the height. It's just a little bit thick and chunky. A little bit, a little too much. So we're kind of we're getting there. Um, I want to show you guys a knife that really spoke to me. This was a knife that was uh, suggested by more than one viewer, and I ended up buying it. I ended up buying the small guy. This is the Kaiser Doman. Boy, is this a great example of an aesthetic that I like and a lot of the elements that I'm looking for. Drop point blade, fully flat ground. We have a, a genius situation here with how they did, how they made the thumb stud accessible in this position and also uh, have it acting as an external stop pin. Instead of keeping these lines here and just moving up, sort of like how they do it on the ZT0562 um, or the Rick Hinder XM18, you see how the, the handle kind of keeps the same line. What they did is they they kept the emphasis on the position of the thumb stud when you're going to deploy it, and then they just made a cutout back here in the scale and dropped it down so it is still acting as that external stop pin that I want. Um, it keeps the thumb stud completely out of the cutting path, completely, right? Then we have these shadow boxed, lightly textured, nicely chamfered G10 scales over a steel liner that's been a little milled on the inside. We have two body screws going into a backspacer, right? Keeps that nice open body design, uh, but at the same time, you have plenty of structural integrity. I mean, I'm not going to be able to squeeze this thing and make it flex or anything like that. Um, Functional backspacer that's got a um, lanyard loop that's out of the way. Simple pocket clip that's been cut into, no wait, has it been? I can't, I think it's actually sitting on top of this guy. I would prefer that it was cut into it. We'll get to that when we review this knife, but pretty darn good. Simple pocket clip is carrying about right here. My point is, is it has, it's so close to, it's also N690 steel, right? And this is the little guy. I can get my hand all the way around. It's missing the choil. I'd prefer a forward choil so that I can choke up on this knife if I want to, right? Some people are going to disagree with me there, but I want that choil. This, and if the bigger one, I'd have gone for the bigger Doman if the uh, bigger one was not in VG10. I know a lot of you like VG10. I just, I feel like I can get a better steel. I feel like 154CM, uh, N690, and D2 are better steels than VG10 right now for the money. Uh, the, this is an, an excellent example of what I'm looking for. It's very simple, very straightforward. It's ergonomic, right? Missing some jimping, missing a couple little things, but we're close here. Um, I love how simple the bug out is. And I know that the bug out is not a budget blade, especially the one I've built here, but man, this is a good look. You know, we changed some of the elements with this, mixed it some of the elements with this, 
and we're getting really good there. Maybe make it a little bit, little bit taller, a little bit thicker, a little bit heavier. The, the contouring that we've got going on here with the Hogue Ritter is excellent. Um, uh, really uh, exemplified, I think, in the Shaman. This is a much less expensive way to do um, some ergonomic contouring. You know, the, the contouring and the texturing on the Ritter, it's kind of amazing to me that they got to, because uh, there's a lot of work on the G10 scales there. Um, some people are going to know better, better there than me, but this is much easier to do, right? I mean, on a imagine these scales here on a budget blade. This should be easy to do, the chamfering. Leave this part up here flat and add a little bit of texturing like this, some grippiness. Um, and then the whole idea, keeping in mind essentially what Rick Hinder has done with his line, is making it modular. Modular Modularity is important. It can't just be about customization. The parts between the knives. Don't make the pocket clip on the little guy smaller than the pocket clip on the big guy. Make them modular. So if there's, if there's a, a new pocket clip that comes out in the secondary market that'll fit the big one, it'll fit the small one too, even if it's a little bit wonky on that design. That's, that's nice. That gives me a reason to want to buy both. I can switch the parts out, right? If you keep the body screws the same size, I know that a lot of people are like, yeah, but that doesn't look as good aesthetically when you have the same size pivot and the same size body screws. I don't care. That makes me want to buy both knives. Right, so I can switch the parts out between. Now, obviously, the scales aren't going to fit, but little things like that, you know, it makes it so much easier for the aftermarket to do that. And if you, I mean, if you get really, if I mean, I'm speaking from no experience whatsoever. I'm not going to pretend for a second like, oh, it's easy. Just do it like this. No, this is what I'm trying to say is, is that if it were me, I would I, at first I would want the support of the aftermarket to make my product look more desirable. But eventually, I would like to be like, all right, I want to make these parts for myself. Uh, think I'm crazy? That's literally what Rick Hinderer did. That's literally what Rick Hinderer did. He has this this like empire, you know. Not, I mean, but he has this basically, you know, between a bunch of different retailers, this sort of this super center setup of you know, you want a specific scale, you want a certain color of G10 scale, you want left hand friendly uh, G10 scales, you want titanium scales, you want. Um, different anodizations, you want flat, you want reflective, you want different texturing, different designs, you want different colored hardware, you want different pocket clips, you want exotic pocket clips, you want all that, you know, whatever, and at the same time, all these different finishes, he's li literally, that is the story, that, that's his success story, it worked. But all those other elements have to be there, it has to be a functional design, it has to be an ergonomic design, it has to deploy correctly, it has to be durable, right? It has to be able to, to do all of that stuff. This is the, the whole point of this is catering to as many different people as possible and customization and modularity is absolutely an element of that. Absolutely. I get, <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm hearing the, this, the intensity come out of my, my voice right now, you know, but it, I, I do feel very passionate about this, you know. Uh, the Shaman, once again, is one of the closest, um, the, the model that I, I, you know, between the Shaman and the Rat, you know, the elements between these two, they just they just have nailed it, you know. Um, I like the height of the shaman. It might be a little bit too high. A little bit of a flat here, carrying the robustness of the thickness down, you know, um, uh, it's more towards the tip, keeping the durability there, but it drops far enough to get the edge, you know, fairly sharp. Not a laser beam, but fairly sharp, good working edge. Running on phosphor bronze, has that forward twill, has that good ergonomic shape, right? The hand positions, the contouring, it's got a nice strong lock. Um, we've got a uh, pivot bushing on the inside, which is really nice. I don't know if we do that on the budget version. Uh, T8 and then two T8 body screws going into a bag spacer. Good pocket clip design. Lantern hole that's not really in the way, in my opinion. I mean, that's just, it's a good model. That's kind of what I'm looking for, but in a budget knife, you know, and I think it absolutely could be done. Or, and it's very close in some models that already exist. Guys, I think I've covered everything I possibly can for today's video. Um, if you enjoyed this video or are still finding this series entertaining, you know, please leave a like. Like I said, there's links in the description for all this stuff as well as the tools that I use to maintain my stuff like the Wii Bit Selector, uh, my Wii Driver, and also some of the EDC items that I carry every single day. So check that stuff out if you'd like to support the channel in that way uh, using my links. Um, if you enjoyed this video, like I said, please leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do of course have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do don't like. So check that stuff out. And if you enjoy all my content, click on this middle complex logo right here and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. 
Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.